I remember the day uh, that the U.S. Capitol had been overtaken by rioters in Washington, D.C. I had been watching the news. It was late at night. I looked through my screen at the thousands of protestants all gathered, and I was shocked. How did this happen? How could something like this, in a democracy like the United States, prevail in such spectacular fashion? One of the answers is the role the media played in shaping the perception, the opinion, and the behaviors of the people partaking in the right. With ever growing dangers stemming from alternative facts to fake news, how can people today, and especially the younger generations, navigate through the troubled waters of information overflow? Let's start from the beginning. You know those items you have in your household that take up a lot of space and dust sometimes? You might know them as books. What you might not know is that the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg in the 15th century is considered by many as a revolution similar to the internet in our days. In fact, before Gutenberg, it could take up to several years to make one copy of a book such as the Bible. After Gutenberg's breakthrough, however, one copy of the Bible took about a week to make. Suddenly, Information previously accessible to the few privileged became accessible to the wider public in large numbers. Suddenly, it was possible to flood people with information. Later inventions have also contributed to the spread of information to the masses, such as the radio, mainly attributed to Marconi in the late 19th century, the television, which became mainstream starting the 1950s, and finally, the World Wide Web, which in 1990 made the possibility to access endless inflowing information available to the masses. Today, just for you to have an idea, if you would like to watch all of the content on YouTube, it would take you more or less 30,000 years, and even then, you wouldn't have finished, as every minute adds an additional three weeks to YouTube. This means that never before has there been so much information to inform, educate, and entertain mankind. And nonetheless, never before have people felt to be so uninformed, so uneducated, so bored, and so distrustful of the media. Study done by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism in 2022 showed that 58% of people do not trust most media most of the time. Consequently, the abundance of information is not a guarantee that people will believe what they read, hear, or see in the media. Actually, one of the main problems is the authenticity of what one reads, hears, or sees in the media. What I mean is, how sure are you that the news you have consumed on your preferred media is true, is real, authentic, genuine? In other words, based on fact. How sure are you that the news you have consumed has not been made in order to influence or even mislead? No, problems like these aren't anything new because, indeed, misinformation is as old as the world itself. If you take an example from the Bible, for example, it talks about how the serpent misled Eve about the consequences of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Another example is attributed to the Phoenicians, who were an ancient merchant civilization in the Mediterranean. What is today known as Gibraltar was back, was back then known as the Pillars of Hercules, for which the Phoenicians reportedly propagated myths and about monsters and dangers surrounding those waters to stop people from getting trade routes. Now, unfortunately, misinformation wasn't only spread to stop people from getting those trade routes. The Drake's Affair of 1894 to 1906 
is a pretty grim example, where falsified evidence and reports were used to convict Alfred Dreyfus, a French army officer, of treason. Now, of course, the reports were later have found to have been false. However, the, ma the media played a big role in the meantime, inciting the French population against Dreyfus through newspaper articles. But perhaps the most dangerous of cases is not of misinformation, but of manipulation. One of the most recent examples is the Cambridge Analytica scandal, where the biggest Facebook information leak to date had supposedly been taken advantage of in order to better influence the U.S. elections of 2016 and the Brexit vote. Funnily enough, it was also during the 2016 presidential U.S. elections that the terms fake news and alternative facts gained prominence. Now, for those of you who have noticed, alternative facts and fake news are nothing but fancy words for lies. They are used in order to influence and manipulate people's perception, opinions, and behaviors. Realizing this is only a small step, however. Realizing when something is an alternative fact or fake news is crucial, as many of them may tend to sound believable at first sight. At least when taken out of context. When presented against proven facts, a lot of them tend to dissolve. Now, despite the dangers of information overflow and the risks of manipulation and misinformation, the media can be used as a force for good in at least three of its functions. The first of which is to inform. News outlets, such as newspapers, I don't know if any of you read the L'Essentiel, for example, television news channels, radio news segments, and online news websites uh, keep the, provide to the audience in all areas of public interest, keeping the audience up to date with the information about the world around them. They also serve as the famous fourth estate, holding those accountable uh, in, that are in charge for their words and actions. Finally, the media can be used as an important tool for disseminating urgent information, such as weather alerts, emergency broadcasts, and health advisories, helping to ensure public safety. The second form is to educate. Documentaries and investigations delve deeper into specific topics, giving comprehensive insight, detailed examination on topics like historical events, scientific discoveries, and cultural phenomena. There are also educational programs ranging from children's programming that cover basic um, concepts and skills to adult education series that cover topics like science, history, and technology. Overall, the media can be a crucial tool for lifelong learning. And finally, expert analysis and opinion pieces can help uh, the audience understand complex issues, understand new perspectives on topics like economic trends, technological innovations, and political developments. Finally, the third form is to entertain. For example, TVs and films provide entertainment through TV shows, films, streaming content, and other visual media forms. The radio also provides entertainment through music, talk shows, and entertainment programming, catering to a wide variety of auditory preferences and creating a soundtrack for many people's daily lives. Finally, interactive websites, such as video games or you know, interactive websites, uh, offer entertainment through active participation. Uh, providing an immersive experience for viewers. Now, given the fact that the media can be used as a force for good, as well as tools for misinformation and manipulation, how can you, and more importantly, how can we, young people, navigate safely through the mass of 
to today we have. But by first developing our video literacy skills. The first step is to question everything. It doesn't have to be anything complicated. You can ask yourself simple questions like, who is the source? What is their, what is their intention? And is it a fact or an opinion? The second step is to diversify your sources. I know we may all have our preferred medium, but going out of our way to receive the full picture is crucial. When looking at political developments, for example, try looking at different viewpoints, like left, center, and right-wing uh, news sources, as well as both local and international outlets. The third step, and one of the most important, is to fact check. There are numerous websites that you can visit, such as PolitiFact, Agence Transparence, Fact Check, The Washington um, Post Fact Checker, Reuters Fact Check, you get the point, right? The fourth step is to create content. To use the media not just as consumers, but as producers of the content, who can help the audience understand understand topics, as well as many other things. Finally, the last step is to consider your digital footprint. Every like, every comment, and every view you give online can be, and is, traced back to you. When online, if you share information that may not exactly be factual, that unfortunately is on you. So when you're on media, be mindful of what you decide to publish and share. Because as we stand at the intersection between history and innovation, let us embrace the responsibility that comes with access to information by becoming mindful, critical, and proactive users of the media. We, together, can shape a future where the media continues to be a force for good. And that is why I call upon educational institutions to continue supporting comprehensive programs aimed at efficiently educating students about the um, negatives and positives of the media. And at the same time, to make sure that it is a compulsory part of the program, ranging from primary schools to high schools. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about navigating the troubled waters of information overflow. It's about learning to swim confidently, making informed decisions, and educating everyone in the world around us. Let us be the generation that navigates through the media landscape, not just with caution, but with the wisdom and courage to not only use it for the betterment of ourselves, but for the world around us.